Welcome, guys, to the first episode of Saddle Lighthouse. Yep. I'm Evan. I'm Jason. It's long overdue. Very long <laughs> it's been overdue. How many days? I announced this podcast January yes. for like third, the day of my birthday. And our original release date was supposed to be like at the end of February. At the end of February 28th. It is currently very late. <laughs> Way past it's like that. almost all the way it's through It's so March. bad. I don't even want to talk about it. A lot of things has happened. It's fine. Like, honestly, much delays, much delays, but it's finally here because we wanted to deliver a quality product and not some rushed bullshit so no um we we had to start this from scratch yeah we, we literally we literally had zero podcast experience and equipment and we had to figure it all out we don't know what to get we had to get like the tripods or the camera all this equipment and everything clean up my room it was a lot of work it was a lot of work he made me like rearrange furniture it was hard yeah and this is like our second time trying to record it's fine. It'll work this time. It, you I know promise. What? I think it teach it puts you in a position to a lot of things, such as like failure. It, like we failed a lot of times trying to record this. We did fail a lot of times. Yeah, and then we have to recuperate, we regroup, rethink, and how can we solve this? How can we work as a team to solve this? And we keep trying again. I think that's a great analogy to life. Yeah, I think so. And I, you know what? I think we're doing a pretty good job. Thank you. Just now we posted something on your instagram yes and it was a picture of it was a picture of you and marco that i took mm, a few days ago Mm -hmm. what did we title it uh we called it the omega and alpha man of delta class um so for those of you who don't know me and jason are fraternity brothers at a university in the bay area and uh, Marco is is also one of my fraternity brothers, and he and I joined at the same time. Yeah. So when you join at the same time, it's called a pledge brother. Yeah. He's he's my my pledge brother, and so we were part of the same class, which is which was called Delta class. So the the Alpha and Omega man, the Alpha man is the first to initiate, and the Omega man is the last to initiate, and and the it's considered like an honor uh to be either one of these things being the alpha man means that you were like a leader among your brothers that you know people really saw you as being um somebody who who was like inspirational Mm -hmm. and and who who did a lot like the most deserving yeah Mm -hmm. and and the omega man is supposed to be like the you know the guy who makes sure nobody gets left behind yeah. Um, the supportive guy. Yeah, very supportive. And so me and Marco were actually also uh, president and vice president of our pledge. Class. Who was the president? Who was vice president? I was president and he was vice president. And so I was the alpha man and he was the omega man because we really put in the work for it. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, it. yeah. He, and honestly, he's one of my closest friends. He's today. your roommate. He as is well. my roommate, yeah. I respect and love both of you. The amount. You guys are the old guard. Yeah, we absolutely are. Now we're we're the old guys in the chapter now, which is very strange. Because mm-hmm. um, to me, I it still feels like if it was day one, you know, it still feels like if there should be somebody who knows a lot more. Than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you tell me stuff about like. Of course, we can't get into too deep into it. There are such fraternity secrets, um, but you tell me like about like processes and things about the fraternity that I'm like, hey, I didn't know that. Yeah. All the time. But you know what? I'm the sort of person who does like a lot of unnecessary research. And I think I think you know that <laughs> you about do. me. Like, like I, I really yeah. look into things that like nobody needs to know about anything. I mean, we went to an Irish pub earlier this week for the, I went there for the first time. Can mm-hmm. we can we say the name? Yeah. Yeah, it's called O'Flaherty's. It's in uh downtown, it's in San, downtown Jose. San Jose. Shout out to O'Flaherty's and Mary O'Flaherty. Mar- we who- met her. She's the owner of the bar, and she Lovely is lady. a very, very nice lady. She she called me and my friends four handsome boys in, in Gaelic. Irish, Gla- Irish Gaelic. Irish Gaelic. Yes, yeah. she did. We had a great time there. We did. It was good. It was a good time. We went for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we had a couple beers. We had some food and got ripped off. Um, I got ripped off. No, I remember. I remember what I was gonna say. I remember because uh, we were talking about research. 
So when we were there, you told me the day after, like, oh, I did some research, and I see you like doing a lot of research all the time, which leads to the other thing about you is that you're like almost like a walking encyclopedia. Yes, I am the sort of person who just has a million facts about crap that nobody needs to know. That's like all yeah. the furniture at O'Flaherty's bar is imported directly from Ireland. Yeah. So it's like if they picked up an Irish pub in Ireland and they just flew, flew it. it. To San Jose, San Jose and they just dropped it down. Yeah. It's if really you're great. ever in San Jose, highly recommend. Highly rec- Very uh, much worth the money. Everybody's really friendly there. The food is really good. They have a really good selection of beers. Um, please, it's, yeah. it's, the atmosphere is just fantastic. And they have uh, Celtic music on Tuesdays. Oh, they have trivia night. We should go to trivia night on Wednesdays. Yeah, we do need to go oh, to the okay. trivia night. Yeah, I don't know. Well, like, there's a lot of good places to go in downtown, don't you think? Like... I There's think, a lot. I think, you know, the Bay Area has so much to, to offer. There's so much to do. I think we really need to, to explore more up the peninsula, you know? I feel like there's a lot of cool places that we could go. There's a lot of Silicon Valley history that, that you can see, and a lot of it is free. Like, do you know why Palo Alto is called that? Uh, I think in Spanish it means tall stick. Yes, but do you know why it's called uh, Tall Dude, stick? I know. I read Wikipedia, too. You know, you're not the only one that reads <laughs> Wikipedia. Okay, so I know it's called Tall stick because of a tree there that's called Tall stick. Yes, but did you know that that tree is still alive and you can still go see the Tall stick? I did not know that. Yeah, you can You can still go see the, po- the Palo Alto yeah. for which the city is named. Um, it's in a park, and it's kind of like, I guess... <sighs> what oh no i'm thinking of another tree sorry <laughs> okay um it's sort of like right next to the to the caltrain tracks they have like a these like tubes with water running up the side to like mist all the way up and down oh, the to tree. water the tree yeah to to try and make sure that it pre- to preserve its health as much as possible because it's such a historic we should of- definitely go i was thinking of another tree i was thinking of the world's tallest tree it's a redwood tree and they keep that location unknown so that people don't damage it. I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it is pretty it's cool. World's tallest tree, but they keep it secret. And we should also take the VTA and, and train there. Um, because oh, yeah. you know we, how we can take the Cal train there. Gas prices are so expensive nowadays. So, like, I don't want to. Yeah, gas prices are way out of control. Evan, what is your take on why gas prices are way out of control? Oh, it's entirely to do with the russian war in ukraine entirely i think i think so i think everything else is just a little bit of kind of bullshit but like the real reason that gas prices are so high is Mm -hmm. because europe's not getting any gas from russia america's nobody's getting any any gas from russia so one of the world's largest suppliers of petroleum products has basically entirely stopped exporting, not because they want to, but because everybody hates Sanction- them now. We're just literally sanctioning them. And so, you know, when there's less supply and there's the same amount of demand, prices go up. That's just that's just law, law of economics, you know? In many ways, I think, like, we're not fighting a war, but we're like, there's, there's the effects of it. We feel the effects, like the gas. Oh, we absolutely feel the effects of the war. You know, if you ever wanted to buy a Russian caviar, well, you can forget about it now. If you ever wanted to buy vodka, uh, you're going to have to buy uh, Polish vodka because Russian vodka is no longer allowed to be uh, imported. Or I think maybe you can, but it's like a stupid tax that's like really high. You you mentioned that one of the things you wanted to talk about today was Russia, Ukraine and the whole conflict. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? You know, I personally, obviously, these are my own personal beliefs, and I can only speak for for myself. For yourself, yeah. Um, But I I personally am very much in in favor of uh, Ukraine Mm -hmm. and Ukrainian independence and sovereignty. I think it's a a ridiculous notion that uh, a country can hold on to claims for territory that it used to hold just because it used to hold it. Because if you want to use that logic, then that enables a resurgence of colonialism all around the world. Because how many European countries held land in other places at at another time? Pretty much all of them. And if they want to use that bullshit argument and say, oh, well, we used to own it, so it's ours still, which is what Russia is doing, right? 
if everybody wants to use that argument, then then like y- the Europeans can just recolonize the whole planet. You know which European country didn't logic. colonize? Uh, Poland. Pol- yeah, Poland didn't have any colonies. Sweden. No, Sweden had a colony. What? Yes, uh, Delaware. Delaware was a Swedish colony. Um, what? Shout out to Delaware. Shout out to Delaware. Joe Biden's from there. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, apparently, there's like a train station named after him because he's a big, big fan of Amtrak. Mm-hmm. That's in Delaware. I don't know. I wonder if they have an ice cream flavor named after him. <laughs> you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if like uh, Ben and Jerry's made a Joe Biden yeah, ice yeah. cream flavor. Joe Biden eating ice cream. That's that's the most we'll talk about him, at least for our first podcast. Yeah, no. We're he, not getting too deep into politics. Man loves ice cream. Who doesn't love ice cream? Uh, I don't think there's lactose any... Lactose intolerant people. Yeah, lactose intolerant. You know what? You can get uh, dairy-free ice creams. Mm. They have, they have like, uh, vegan ice cream and stuff now. Yeah. Let's quickly regroup and talk about Europe and colonies and also Ukraine. Did Norway have any Norway had colonies? Vinland what's vinland vinland was uh to we today it's called uh, newfoundland it's a province in canada canada mm-hmm. and um it was briefly held by you're gonna say the vikings yes by the vikings does that count though because like it was formerly a part of the kingdom of norway <sighs> finland no, no finland never had any colonies denmark yeah they did what yeah where greenland Yes, but also the U.S. Virgin Islands were purchased off the Danes. You know who didn't colonize? Who? Ukraine. That is correct, because they were part of Russia at the time. Okay, let's go back to R- Ukraine then. Um, um, so I personally, I think Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, is a fantastic president. He's doing such a good, a good leader. job yeah. of staying there and really showing the world that... Ukrainians are not afraid and they will not be, you know, they will, they will not submit to Russian yeah. aggression and, you know, Russian warfare and, and, you know, Putin's evil demands. What's crazy is we all have all this technology now. So people are recording it and it's just so surreal and, and seeing those things. Um, whereas a lot of these conflicts in the past, right? Like World War II or Vietnam, like they didn't record them like it is now with color, like, 4k like uh i will say this about um the whole thing right now a couple days ago arnold schwarzenegger former former governor governor re- did you see that video no that i did released? not uh, what did, what did the governor do the governor released like a nine minute video um talking about the whole situation and he addressed it to like russian soldiers and russian people and he just did it in a such civilized a uh, well-spoken way um explaining the situation and telling the russian people like this is a terrible war you've been misguided by your government he lists out the facts um and he was like the russian people are great people and i think they are but they have just been i think their government or their leader putting all these young russian lives in danger for their own ambitions yeah but you know what i i i think um uh, not a, not every russian person is misguided about this i think there, there's a lot of people who have been protesting they support it in in moscow there have been a lot of people who who have said, you know, oh, yeah. we don't actually want this. Please don't end the war. Please, please end the war. We don't want to be in this war. Um, I was listening to a news report last night about this woman who held up a sign uh-huh. um, uh, in the background <gasps> of like the a TV Russian one. state yeah, the television. TV, yeah. And it said in both Russian and English, yeah. no war. No war, yeah. Um, he, uh, the the governor also said at the very end is like, the Russians who are protesting and risking their lives are getting beaten and getting sent to like sent away, right? Like he was like, "You are my new heroes," and and I really respect those Russians that are out there and protesting. Yeah, I, I definitely think those those people, along with all the Ukrainian people who are fighting for their homeland and for their lives and for their families, they're they're real heroes. Yeah, when I when I did that fundraising for Ukraine uh, last week. There's people that care on our campus. Some lady donated like 50 bucks. Some people, one girl was like, hey, my phone's dead. But let me go charge my phone in the student union. And I'm going to come back. And I'm going to Venmo you and donate. Like, she did that. She came back. 
know, she didn't have to do that. People were, were very like, oh, I, I don't even want th- to put my email down because I, I trust you with it. Most people were very kind. Of course, there was some adversity, I think, some challenges. Some people stole from us. Mm-hmm. Some people walked up and challenged us. But you know what? I think you just got to stay positive because most people were very supportive and very thankful, especially for all the brothers that supported me. Yeah. Uh, I definitely think that most people in the Western world at least know and understand mm-hmm. wh- whose side they should be on in this in this conflict. Um, do do does everybody do enough? Not not really, but no. But I think at least everybody is informed enough to know whose side they should be on. I think that's <laughs> one one good thing about like uh, the phones and, and technology. Like we're all up to date on stuff like that. Um, whether or not we're too up to like always addicted to our phones, that's another conversation. But I think you're right. Like most people do know which side they're on, or or which is the right side, wrong side, whatever. Yeah, I I think most people are able to. T- I mean, because you can see it for yourself. Like you like you were talking about earlier. There's videos in 4K of you know what's yeah. going on in Ukraine, and I think it makes it really obvious whose side you should be on. Um. You know, I, I was listening to a news report uh, when I was flying back from L.A. about how there are children in kindergarten that their parents are having a hard time talking to them about this war. Like, yeah. what, what do you how do you talk to a how child you, about, yeah. you know, the fact that your country is being invaded and that, you know, they're you're getting shelled by artillery it's terrible. And, and, you know, like, how do you, how do you talk to a child about that? You know, because that's very traumatizing. Um, I can do you only just not tell them. I don't know. No, you have to, you have to, you have to, because you know what? They, they know that something's going on oh, when yeah, they hear adults idiots, yeah. talking, when they hear the sound of distant explosions, mm-hmm. they know that something's happening. They know that something's wrong. And when they see the way that adults are acting and feeling, they can sense the energy you know, they can sense that negative feeling. So you have to say something. The challenge is, what do you say uh, to not scar your child for life? You right. Know? And I think they could kind of experience it as well, because I, I know that I saw a video today that most men, uh, 18 to 60, I believe, are having to stay or encourage or the government is making them or whatever. They want to fight for their homeland, right? Mm-hmm. So what's happening is a lot of these men, fiancés, husbands, fathers, they would drop off their kids and wife, families at the train station or by the border, Polish border, whatever it is, and they would go back, leave the family, know that they're safe, they're in another country, go back and fight. So then the kid would be like, yo, where's dad, man? Like, yeah. they could, they'd know. Like, so you're going to have to tell them. Yep. And, uh, you know, interestingly, yes, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I believe no Ukrainian man in between ages 18 and 60 is allowed to leave. Yeah. But you'll see that like everybody is wants to do their part um you know that i saw on the official instagram of the government of ukraine Mm -hmm. there was a post where this man who's a drag queen is enlisted in the army and he's like he's shooting those russians you know Mm. and i'm like drag no not in drag oh, okay. but that that would be really cool <laughs> dude that's a superhero movie right <laughs> that there. that would be such a, a, that would be a fun movie yeah um but no he's like you know there, there are people everybody want everybody wants to do their part mm-hmm. and I, I you know it i think it's especially important for you know certain groups of people like like the lgbt community yeah. because russia is so homophobic um or at least their government is yeah that you know, the idea of of Ukraine becoming part of Russia would be a real travesty for all the LGBT people in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Are they right now or, you know, before they got invaded or whatever, were they pro-LGBT? I think... What were they? They U- were more... Yeah. Ukraine isn't... It's definitely not, like, the most forward in LGBT rights. Uh-huh. But it's certainly better than Russia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Like, nobody... Uh, as far as I know, nobody's ever been, like jailed for being gay in ukraine in recent history whereas like in russia you go to jail you you go to jail oh wow so the official russian policy is that you can be as gay as you like you just can't promote it to children Mm -hmm. but they use the excuse that like if you've done anything visible or in public 
if you if you have a pride parade, right? That's in public. The, a child can theoretically see it, so therefore it's promoting it to children. Got it. So there's no such thing as a pride parade in Russia. They they just it's not a thing. So they just use it as an excuse to to you know basically suppress all LGBT rights. Slava Ukraine is that yes. the right term? Um, man, hope, hope hope the war ends soon. I sure hope so. I really hope. I and with the right the correct side winning yeah. ukraine obviously right so then the, the yeah. next uh, thing that i wanted to talk about was that uh you know russia is kind of having a really difficult time in ukraine they're they're not they're not doing too well they thought it was going to be a really fast war and they thought it was going to be really quick and that it was going to be really easy but this isn't the first time that russia's actually had a very hard time beating somebody that they thought was going to be easy Afghanistan. Yes. Well, the Soviets fought Afghanistan in the 80s, and that did not work out for them. Um, but even before that, they fought the Finns in the Winter War in the 30s, and that mm-hmm. didn't work yeah. out for them. Um, and before that, they fought the Japanese in the Russo-Japanese War. Oh, they got destroyed. And they got, they got, they got slapped. They got fucking slapped they in the, the face. They had the better military, too. Yes, they had a, they had a numerically superior army and navy and and they just the japanese just slapped the shit out of them um which was actually a very momentous moment because it was the first time that a non-european country beat what uh what was considered to be a major power yeah western power yeah Mm -hmm. and so it was really really like incredible and and kind of a the beginning of the end or a sign of the beginning of the end of colonialism. Colonialism ended... Would you say the age of colonialism, Bulger? I think for the most part, the age of colonialism is over. Obviously, there's still bits and bobs, little islands that that countries hold. I, I guess the, the major exception would be like French Guiana, mm-hmm. um, because it is still considered part of France. Um... But like, pretty much. I don't, I don't think there's very I, many. I I I'm I still don't understand the concept of the Commonwealth. Like, how does that all work? What do you What do you mean the concept of the Commonwealth? It's just like an economic trade block. It, it's oh, I thought it was like Canada's head of state is still the queen. Yes, it is. Okay, isn't that still colonialism? No, because the the Canadians. That's Sovereign. she's not the head of government. But like, what? What's she, the difference? Head of state, head of government? So the head of state is like, who do you think of as a representation of a country? Whereas the head of government is the person who actually makes laws and oh, okay. does stuff like that. In America, it happens to be the same person. It's the president. But in the United Kingdom, for example, just because it's the easiest, the head of state is Queen Elizabeth II. And head the government? head of government is the prime minister. Ah. And that's the way that it is in the vast majority of Commonwealth countries. Um, the queen is the head of state and the head of government is their prime minister or president, depending on the place. Um, but how do you feel about the concept of neocolonialism? You know, I really don't know. I mean, like, if, you're, if you mean in the sense of, like, economic exploitation yeah. Yeah. of other yep. countries, yep. I think this is obviously something that is not 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 very good it's not good you know i i think definitely china engages uh, is in a lot of that you know they they use a lot of that oh we're gonna talk about china a lot in this podcast oh yeah i'm sure we are (laughs) (laughs) we're gonna talk gonna be fun a lot about china hopefully we're not banned oh you don't care you don't want to go to no i don't want to i don't want to go to mainland china i want to go to mainland china well you're I have relatives in mainland China. It's a little too late now. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't really know them. We already said something bad about China, so it's too late. Well, they're neo-colonialists. Yeah, that, that I guarantee you. If, if, Going uh, into Africa. If Xi Jinping hears this podcast, which he never will, because... I doubt it. He's It's all going to be blocked in China. But a CCP but, representative. Yeah, or if, bot, if some CCP, CCP bot. bot or representative hears this podcast, they're going to say... That we're evil Westerners spreading propaganda against the Chinese people, and they're going to ban us from I'm, mainland China. We're probably not going to ever work for a Chinese company. No. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, man. Um, but I guarantee you, though, guaranteed 100%, if, if I ever went to 
mainland China, I would immediately be arrested. Just, Why don't you want to go to mainland China? Hey, I think because of my opposition to the politics and policies of the CCP, I don't have any problem with Chinese people, Chinese history, Chinese culture, Chinese any of that. What I do have a problem with is their their government and the way that their government is run. I would love to go to China if it was a free country. I would I would love to go to Taiwan. I would Taiwan's love Taiwan's amazing. I'm sure. I, I people th- are so friendly. Well, I'm gonna I'm hot hot very hot for a first episode. Oh man. I'm sorry, you know you know I have to say it. Say it. Taiwan is it's not Taiwan. It's the Republic of China. It's the real government of China. There's only one government and it is the Republic of China, which happens to be set situated on the island of Taiwan. I was not expecting this on the first episode. <laughs> Neither was I. <laughs> Hey, but it's got to come out when it comes out. It's it's got to come out, and I'm sorry. I, I take a very strong stance on, on this this conflict. And just like that, you're banned. <laughs> yeah, just like that. That that's it. It's over. Um, Speaking of like the neocolonialism, like you're probably twenty years from now, you might not be able to go to a lot of those African countries. Maybe I don't, I don't think that that's true. I think I think if if the West decides to do what's right. And to help these countries uh, to develop in a non-exploitative fashion, I think that they would be really grateful for us. I think that the only reason that these countries resent us currently is because the West has historically yeah. exploited them. And if if we chose to, to do something not, to make up for it... I don't think we're going to do anything. I don't think America? we are either. But in theory, right, if we did... Okay, in theory... Right. Hypothetically, if we were to actually show them that the West was a better option than China, right? If we were to say, hey, China wants to trap you with this like building infrastructure, but then you have to lease it to a Chinese company for 999 years, right? If we were to say, we'll just give you the money to build the port and you can do with what you want, I think they would like us. I think they would. (laughs) I think a lot of developing countries would say, yeah, America's pretty great. But right now, like, they don't have an option. Their only option is either China or just stick with the way things were. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, and that's true. But I think that the West should roll out some kind of plan. Kind of, I thought Joe Biden was... Um, oh, and how we're talking about Joe Biden again. But Joe Biden, like, was talking that the West was going to do something similar to China. But I, 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 not I heard, heard of something updates. about that, that the G7 yeah, countries G7, were going to yeah, try and do something, something like about that. that. Yep. Yep. Um, but the thing is that they haven't, and I, I would love to see the G7 do something uh, much similar to what China's doing, but far less exploited. I think if the West doesn't do anything, China really will take over the world. Because if you look at it, right, I think 100 years from now, Africa will be the main continent. Uh, does that make sense? Because I think Europe, falling birth rates. Africa, huge birth rate, huge population, huge amount of resources. Mm-hmm. Um, dude, Europe can't even go out of real, uh, reliance of Russian gas. You know, like they're gonna have to do their own. They have to figure no, that I, out. I don't think that 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 they're gonna be relying on Russian gas forever. I think no. I think this they're this, this conflict is gonna push them away from their reliance on thing. Russian yeah. gas. That's one of the very few positive impacts that this conflict has had. Is you know really sending a wake up call to Europeans that they can't sit there and and rely on russian gas because the russians yeah. are bad they you know they're an authoritarian country that doesn't care about human rights they don't and you know i think they bombed the child hospital yeah they did they bombed like a theater where people were they're going after civilians yeah they really are okay. they, they're really targeting civilians but let's talk about africa again because man that's Oh, they're they're absolutely the the economic center of the world is shifting towards Africa every Africa, day. Africa is it only Africa? What else? Southeast Asia? No, Latin America? No, pretty much. I think Africa. I think Africa, is, Africa is, is going to be Africa is the it. center of the world economy in yeah. like fifty years. Fifty years? Maybe a hundred. Yeah, maybe a hundred, but some somewhere in that region between fifty and hundred. Because China is trying to curve too. That's why they're investing in Africa. Like. Their population is going down as well. Yes, it is. They're, 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 they peaked out already on their population. Yeah. And it is declining. Um, India still has a way to go. I did a project a couple of years ago in one of my business classes. Um, 
it was an international business class mm-hmm. and it was about starting a business in foreign countries and me and my group we called it apex apex industries or something something stupid but we did uh affordable housing in kenya in nairobi and we're talking about there's a slum maybe you've heard of it uh it starts with a k i have not heard of it it's like i don't want to i don't want to get it wrong if i had a jamie if we had a tech guy we would search it up um but yeah dude kenya i did a lot of research into kenya i think kenya is one of the best african countries right now they have their stuff down i think uh personally i think nigeria is is going to be one of the places that ends up being the most successful in africa they have their um, largest economy in africa yes but it, i mean partly it's it's they because they have the largest population, population. Mm-hmm. but it's also just i just i because there's so many people i think it's going to be such a center of economic activity yeah um and it, it they there's so much potential there's so much potential just 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 a little bit fearful you Why? know what i mean because like if it doesn't get done in the right way like if they follow the footsteps of like america or something like look at the energy usage of america like they're gonna have to skip the whole fossil fuel thing yeah see i think that's that's an opportunity that africa really yeah. has to yeah. like when they're building they their reliable power grid i think they have the opportunity to skip fossil fuels and to please do because we're screwed like marco would be devastated (laughs) no marco's a huge uh climate climate guy yeah he's he's definitely an environmentalist environmentalist yes um he's actually the director of sustainability on our campus Um, yes he is we're gonna have him on in a later episode he might be one of our first guests. Yeah, he we might shall be. See. We, we shall we see. We have a long list of people that... They're, oh, like, we, knocking on our door. They're, like, where I the know. heck am Every, I getting everybody invited? Everybody really wants to be on this podcast. I don't blame them. This is... Neither do This I. is very special. Something like this in college. It's something super unique. Yeah, it is. Um, but we were just talking about Africa. But I'm a big fan of Kenya. You're a big fan of Nigeria. 100 years. Um, or in the next few decades. Because th- their economy they're gonna is going really to go well. boom. And for Earth, as a human race, for us to be prosper successful protect this planet whatever you want to be whatever you think our next step in humanity is elon musk thinks is to go to another planet but whatever that is i think it has to involve africa absolutely it's a huge continent there's so much people there's so much bright-minded people there's so much talent there i think the the three places that are really going to be the most important to sway on making uh a sustainable climate future of reality oh, yeah. are going to be Africa, India, and China. Mm-hmm, yeah. Th- those are the three places that really need to be on board if we're all going to do it because India has so many people and there is a, a vast of wealth of talent, a lot. knowledge, resources in India. There's so much that they have to offer. It is incredible yeah. how much... How how many things have come from India? I mean, the, didn't they recently launch uh, a mission to oh, Mars? Like, didn't oh. they recently do something? I thought you were going to talk about the missile. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, man. We got to talk about that later. Yeah, they did send something to Mars. They're doing some great things. It's just of a lot of these countries, you mentioned Africa and India. A lot. It's just unfortunate. Many of those people live in poverty. It is. It's very unfortunate, especially uh, during the time of, of covid like severe poverty. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and COVID made it so it much made, worse. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people in India are like day laborers. And then because of like social distancing rules and stuff like that, they couldn't, they couldn't work and then they couldn't eat. And it, it's, I, I can only imagine the amount of suffering that people had to endure. Well, so much that. so that to them, climate change is secondary. Their number one priority is get out of poverty. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I'm not going to care about climate change if I can't food, put food on the table, you know? Like, yeah. what's one ounce of carbon more if I can provide to my kids? So that goes back to the point where we're like, we have to find a way that something renewable, something that you don't follow the footsteps of, I guess, America, um, where our per capita is so insanely high. Yeah. And Well, like, again, like you said, they have the advantage where they could start from something and build from the ground up something re- re- renewable. Yeah, and well, you know what? I think these these places also have um, a big advantage in just the geographic layout of their cities. Oh yeah, well, I uh, so. Because I think their city cities in Africa and Asia, especially Asia, are a lot more dense. Oh yeah. Um, and so 
the idea of like single family homes mm-hmm. and the like you know long long Lawns, transportations like you know driveways all that is so wasteful it's it so is. environmentally I costly it's, it's terrible right the f- long commutes terrible you know it's it's all terrible right the way that terrible. north american cities are laid out terrible is conducive to cars creating climate change yes you know whereas i think in asia i mean you just just look at a city like tokyo Tokyo is oh the world's largest city, and I guarantee you that that city probably uses less energy than L.A. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I, if we looked at, like, a comparison. Uh, obviously, I don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised if we looked yeah. at a comparison of L.A.'s u- to- energy usage to Tokyo's energy usage. I wouldn't be surprised oh, if Tokyo Lord. used less. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot of um, shade, put a lot of shade towards the Russian government on this podcast but we're gonna say a lot of great things about the japanese oh man government the japanese people. they know how to run a country they know how to live they you know what they, they know how to do they know how to do things efficiently safely and correctly in a polite way in, a polite in an efficient way, way. <laughs> yeah. like we're gonna run out of we're gonna run out of say. like excellent things to say about japan but like i think that you know i think it's a shame that other places in the world can't do things as well as japan like oh, uh, yeah you know for example uh california high-speed rail if any if we i don't know why we didn't contract the japanese to build california high-speed <laughs> rail we contracted uh deutsche bahn international so what is that the germans the, the the german uh rail company they're they're doing uh all the work for the operations 20, of California 50, high speed 2039. rail. 2039. 2039. That's, Why are the Germans so slow? No, it's it's honestly it's not the fault of the Germans. It's the fault of the Californians. But <sighs> but what the the thing is though that if anybody knows how to make high speed rail that is both safe and efficient in an earthquake prone region, it's the Japanese. Does Germany have earthquakes? No. No. Does Japan have earthquakes? Absolutely. They just had one. They just had one this week. Absolutely. And and I don't know why we as a Calif- as Californians who have to deal with earthquakes, why we wouldn't pick the Japanese who are experts in building high-speed rail in places where there are earthquakes. That makes sense. Why did we not do that? That is the stupidest thing that I've ever heard in my life. The Japanese, they I feel like they should export their culture more. In a way that, like, I think the Japanese do export. They their do, culture. they do, like anime and and like entertainment. But I'm talking about the other stuff. I'm talking about the work ethic, and like the culture of politeness, mm-hmm. or like in a way that, like, you know how China's trying to export, like, so you you, you influence that, the world. Mm-hmm. Maybe Japan should start influencing the world. You think that J- uh, Japanese business culture, yeah, should should spread. Well, more. Then, but then when when I say that sentence, like that statement, Japanese Japan should influence the world more people are going to start thinking world war ii and stuff but no i th- i, th- I completely I mean. understand well, you know but you know what sometimes some of those things have spread um the the idea of just-in-time production is uh originated in japan and mm-hmm. that's now very much widely used all around the world um originally mastered by toyota and now now applied everywhere you know i think you know some of these Japanese uh, work principles have been exported to the to the rest of the world, but some things obviously have not. I really like the idea of you know long term relationships with your suppliers and your vendors. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, knowing that you're consistently always going to be working with this company, it makes it so much easier for you. To no, integrate. I think it's also just like the other culture stuff. I mean, it, you've never been to Japan, but you go to Japan, you just feel the culture and you're just like man why isn't the rest of the world like this you go into the 7-eleven there's so many amazing options and the food and the flavors how everything's neat and clean spotless like it's so clean that you're like if i look this ground right now i would probably not get sick you know what that doesn't surprise me at all but you know where else is sort of like that norway norway is very clean norway is really nice i went you know it, Norway has the only 
public bathroom in a park that I would have ever been comfortable <laughs> using. <laughs> like, it's the only it's the only park bathroom oh. that I didn't think I was going to get hepatitis from sitting on the oh seat there. Oh my gosh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You did go to Norway. Yeah, Nor- How long were you there for? I was in Norway for about a week. It was really nice. Oh, only a week. Okay. Um, Norway was really good. Um, I went to Oslo. I still want to go uh, to Bergen and Stavanger. I want to go to the fjords. So Bergen and Stavanger. Okay. Um, I also want to go to Svalbard. Oh, my God. I think- Svalbard. Oh, Sp- that's that island. Yeah, Svalbard okay. is... Um, Interestingly, so Svalbard's a really strange place because it's under the territorial jurisdiction of Norway, but technically it's like an international territory. Yeah. Because everybody's allowed to go there. It was decided when when it was discovered, I guess, that there was like a treaty. They just mine coal there, right? The Russians mine coal there. Oh, the Russians mine coal there. Yeah. yeah. The the uh the Norwegians have a seed vault, the world global seed oh, vault. Oh, that's in Svalbard. It's in Svalbard. God, that place must be heck of cold. It's also technically illegal to die in Svalbard. What? Why? Because your your body would con- contaminate the ground, like the environment, the pristine environment. Oh, it's a pristine environment? Yeah, the, Svalbard is one of the most pristine places on Earth. You're telling me mining coal there does not <laughs> mess up the environment okay, there? The, I mean like the Norwegian-controlled part of it. Oh, okay. Uh, I would love to go on a cruise ship. I know that's bad for the environment, but... Hey, you never know. Electric cruise ships uh, might become a thing. <laughs> I think cruise ships in general, like how they're run, is just wasteful. That's fair. But, that's but fair. it's fun, though. Okay, but I know there's cruise lines in Norway. They go through the... Um, All the fjords, fjords yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And eat and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it'll take like two days. That'd be great. Uh, like from Amsterdam to up to Norway? Is that possible? I don't even know. Um, I think you can probably get a boat from Amsterdam to Copenhagen, from Copenhagen to Oslo, and then from <laughs> Oslo all the way up the coast. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, sounds we like should a great do plan. that. That would be a great time. Yeah. Do you have any other topics on your list? Mm, let's see. What else did I want to talk about today? We talked a lot about Africa, China, Japan, a lot of poli- uh, geopolitics and geography in countries today. What what uh, what would you prefer to talk about? No, I think that's fine. Um, <laughs> but I think it would just have be a good idea to have like a to variety show. Else it's like a variety here. show. Yeah, we yeah, talked yeah, a little yeah. bit about podcasts, a little bit about Marco. We just talked a lot about climate change and countries and politics and mm-hmm, war and mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I love those things, but not everybody does. Right. So so um, I don't know. Have you have you been watching anything good on on TV? You know, I don't watch shows like that. You know me. Um, i know why why is that why don't you watch like tv shows i just spend my times in in other ways Mm -hmm. um i'm not saying it's all productive like i could just be watching youtube i could be literally napping Mm -hmm. um but i don't know like i just go to the gym or work on other things work on the podcast uh plan hksa stuff i i guess uh if you want to if you want to talk about something that's not uh politics related i've been i've been watching daria what is that? Um, Daria is a 1990s animated sitcom about this girl, Daria, who uh, lives in like an upper middle class neighborhood and she hates everybody there. No, it's it's in it's in America. Oh, in America. It's supposed to be set in Maryland, I believe. Maryland. Maryland. Yeah, Maryland. Oh, yeah. How do you like that show? Are you done with it? Did you uh, it? I haven't finished it yet. I, I really like it. Um, I really uh, relate to her disdain for uh the way the you know vapid consumerist culture of america Mm -hmm. so i think she's um you know she's she's like this the lone intellectual in a town full of vacuous people do you think do you think you relate to her yeah that's why that's why i like the show yeah absolutely do you want to talk about your upbringing no too soon (laughs) i can talk about my up my upbringing sure because it's the first episode why don't we talk about us and introduce the host i think that's a good idea we should both do that you don't have to talk too deep about your upbringing sure okay i guess i'll go first but you ask me the questions okay so um so where you where were you born jason yeah so i'm technically an international student no you're not <laughs> how am i not i'm born you're overseas not, but you 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 applied from the united states as oh, a u.s citizen okay, I, I take that back i'm sorry uh so i was born in hong kong 
So I I have an ownership stake um, when we talk about China and like all the politics, CCP and stuff. Obviously, if you haven't been living under a cave, right? We have that whole free Hong Kong movement back right before the pandemic, right? That was twenty nineteen. Like, yeah, that was the last thing before the pandemic. Like that was big. Yep. So I was born there, lived there from until I was seven, and then shortly after my birthday, I think one month after, uh, we moved to the United States, and you know for a whole variety of reasons. One of them was like escaping communism. Uh, I mean, one of them was uh, because my family thought we would just have a better life here, me and my brother. So, yeah, we came here, came to the Bay, lived here ever since, came to school. Uh, I mean, I come to school in one of the colleges in the Bay Area. And so uh, what made you decide to come to this college and what made you pick your major? I wanted to do business because I took a uh, I took engineering classes. I took coding classes computer science classes those are like what a lot of my friends uh, ended up going engineering or computer science but i realized that i was terrible at it so i just followed something i just followed my gut um to something i enjoyed and knew i was good at doing so i chose business hmm. and then how our school does it is that you choose a concentration yeah and i just chose hr uh, mainly because my cousin uh, she she lives in hong kong and she worked in hr she was talking to me about it and i was like okay why not i remember that conversation i just put it in and it's kind of just stuck. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so what are, you, what are your goals for the future, Jason? Oh, a lot of my goals kind of align with Evan now. It's changed over a little bit, but I think in the... F- <laughs> How long have I known you for? Like oh, a couple you, months? you've known me for like... Six months. Yeah. Yeah, in the six months, like, I think a lot of my goals has changed. I think... Uh, but one of my goals is I want to be a recruiter. Mm-hmm. Um, recruit do hr stuff right one Mm -hmm. of the main functions of hr is to recruit people for companies Mm -hmm. um, hiring new people onboarding i want to do that kind of stuff i want to talk to people um see if the fit the organization Uh, but one thing you keep telling me is that i'm really good at biz dev you are really good at biz dev yeah um i think you know a lot about you know things diversity and inclusion you're really good at um you know knowing onboarding stuff Mm -hmm. you're really good at corporate culture yeah you have a very deep understanding of what what corporate culture or organizational culture i'll just say looks like and what what it can do and i think that's very much and the the, importance of like organization yes um i would say that you would you would make a good coo somewhere coo chief organization officer operations Operations officer oh that might be an angle um but other than that like one day i want to s- continue this podcast right now it's just a hobby we're literally filming our first episode mm-hmm. um but i would love to go on some business ventures with you i want to be financially independent i want to travel the world i want to go to africa i want to go to norway i want to make um youtube videos um those are just some of my hobbies yeah that sounds pretty cool yeah so you got any questions for me jason okay let's do you now all right and we're we have just enough time um, just for you, and then we can end it off like that. Okay, I think sounds that's good. An excellent episode. When I first met you, I was like, man, wow, I've never seen a guy that looks like you before. But when you told me what your hometown was like, oh, that's not really what I expected. Mm-hmm. So where are you from? Um, what was your upbringing like? So I am from a suburb of Los Angeles. I lived out in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, People, I I can't say that I live in LA because people from LA will get mad at me. So they'll be like, that's not LA. Yes, it's not LA. But but, it's a city. But nobody knows where the San Gabriel Valley is. But it's a city of LA. It's, no, it's not in the city. Oh, it's not? No, no. LA is not, well, LA is one big continuous city, but. In in the San Gabriel Valley, it's all just a bunch of smaller little cities. It's oh. not it's not part of yeah, the I city of I Los Angeles. You know how like San Jose is like one big gigantic city. Yeah. But then there's also like a ton of small little yeah, cities like Mountain View. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, vale, it's, it's like Cooper if I lived in like Mountain View or Sunnyvale. Oh, yeah. Except poor. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so you know, I kind of grew up out in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, I was the only white person in my school. I was I was really introverted and quiet, and yeah. I didn't talk to a lot of people um, when I was in school. People bullied me when I was a little kid, but mm. it's okay. I survived. 
And I don't know. I ended up here because I wanted to get away from LA. Yeah. I didn't want to go to this. To, I didn't want to go to any of the schools that everybody from high school went to. So I was like, there's no way that I'm fucking going to like Cal Poly Pomona or mm-hmm. um, Cal State LA because everybody from my high school would, would have went to somewhere mm-hmm. like that. So I was like, I'm, I want to get out of here. Yeah. So I went, I, I toured a few schools in the Bay Area. Eventually I picked this one because I had a friend who went here. Um, and that's a story for another time. Oh, yeah. I mean, he might uh, come on the podcast. Yes, he might actually be a guest on this podcast because he works at NASA and he's a really cool guy. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's how I kind of ended up here. I chose international business as my major because when I did study abroad in London, I I really had such a great time. And I said, I want to do anything that I can to get myself back to London. Mm. And I felt like because London was such a big finance city that the best way to get there is to do business so i chose international business i think it fits you very well because we, we were just spending like 45 minutes talking about other countries <laughs> uh, international <laughs> relations international business how africa could be a business like for in the future mm-hmm. so i think it fits you very well yeah I, right I, major. I think it's a it's a good major for me um before that i used to be a political science major oh what yes i actually have a degree in political science and, and it, admittedly it's a it's an associate's degree it's not a bachelor's what degree. do all those associates can they really realistically get you somewhere no <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like a participation trophy kind of like you have to get an associate's degree in something very specific for it to actually end up being useful. Mm-hmm. So the things that I have associate's degrees in are not useful. <laughs> um, I have two associate's degrees in business. I have one in political science and one in international Which relations. one are the two business ones? What do you mean, which ones? Like business what? Like business two. administration yeah. and just business. I, I don't know. Oh. It was a community college, so they didn't... They didn't have like How many units are those associates? Some of them are like like if you, if you're are you just counting the the for the major or are you counting yeah, for all the, the major GE? for for the major. Some of them would be like 35 40 units. Dude, you you have a lot of school under your belt. You have four associates, you're about to finish your bachelor's. You have taken a lot of units. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm you're also such a smart guy. I'm also considering getting a real estate license. Dude, we both have to get a real estate yeah I, th- I think it's just it's just cool to know like I, I took most of the courses i just have one more course which is real estate practice oh you have take community I, college yeah i took uh, i took real estate principles and business law in the legal environment so all i have to take now is a uh, real estate practice and then i can take the exam to be a real estate agent but then once you become a real estate agent you have to I have be to- enrolled or part of a brokerage Yes, so I have to go work for a real estate broker Mm -hmm. for about five years, and then I can take the exam to become a real estate broker. But there's also courses that I have to take in between. Broker. Once you're a broker, you work on your own. Then you're allowed to work on your own. Yeah. When you're a real estate agent, you have to work for For a broker. broker. Yeah. So when you're a broker, you can start your own company. Yep. Oh my! That's one of the things we could do. You (laughs) you want to start a a lot of ideas? We're gonna have a lot of pitch, a lot of business ideas to the point where I think our audience might steal, might be our competitors because someone out there is gonna be inspired by us. Maybe we should just make a whole. uh, This is like a a hot hot take idea, but like a whole, like a segment of unused business ideas that we just do every every episode. Yo, yeah. We'll we'll think of a name like just just businesses that we don't actually intend to ever create, but which yeah. just sound vaguely interesting. I take that kind of back though when I said that our audience might be competitors. But I think when you listen to a podcast, you gain some value from it. If you at the, at the audience get something out of this podcast, then that's even better. Like we should be proud of that. Yeah, I think so. That gives you something of value. To, I mean, I mean yeah, if to come if, back, if you're listening to this podcast and you get Thank rich you. because of it. Uh, send me some money. <laughs> send me some money too, please. Uh, we'll, we'll gladly take a fifty-fifty uh, I'll, split. I'll use it to. Bu- we'll we'll use it to buy better equipment. Don't worry. Oh yeah, definitely. But we're we're also def- pay rent. We're also definitely not going to use it to buy hookers. Like totally not. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, Evan, this was our first podcast. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of stuff done. We talked about ukraine china africa 
introduce the two of us is there anything else you would like to say before we end um like comment subscribe no wait that's youtube subscribe to our podcast it's available on spotify apple podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts follow our instagram follow our instagram satellite house podcast yeah uh we're gonna bring in guests we're gonna have more topics we're gonna talk about more about all the updates in the world um so it's gonna it's only gonna go up from here yeah thanks guys have a good one thank you for listening